Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the lunch seminar. Um, one of the great things about CITP, or one of the things that CITP does, is try to bring together ideas from social science and data science to address questions of interest in tech policy. And we're very lucky to have two people here who do that individually, uh, and a project that they worked on together that does that jointly. So this is lots of CITP stuff all crammed together uh, from, from people who have the real CITP spirit. Um, so we'll be hearing today from Allison Cheney, who you all probably know. She received her PhD in computer science here at Princeton. And now she works in a business school where she engages much more with social scientists. Her research involves many aspects of machine learning as it's applied to social data increasingly. And um, this is a joint project between Allison, uh, Barbara Engelhart, who you all also probably know is a professor of computer science here at Princeton, and Brandon Stewart, who you all also probably know, who is a professor of sociology here at Princeton. Um, so Brandon um, received his PhD in government and then moved into sociology. So he has some interdisciplinary flavor, although political science and sociology might not sound that far apart, they actually are. Um, so it, it was a big move. And Brandon also does a lot of research applying ideas from machine learning to social data, but more from the perspective of a social scientist. And so we have here this wonderful collaboration on this really important problem uh, facing a lot of uh, tech policy makers and people in general. So, Allison. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so thank you all for having me here. Um, we're going to be talking today about um, how we can understand how algorithmic confounding uh, in recommendation systems impacts user homogeneity and utility. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about the problem about recommendation systems. Um, we experience recommendation systems every single day, whether you're doing a Google search or you're on Facebook or reading the news, um, buying something on Amazon. All of these um, domains are where you're interacting with recommendations um, that the, the platforms are providing to you. <clears throat> so the, the primary problem here is um, for personalized item recommendation, you have a set of items that you've um, read, watched, interacted with, purchased. <clears throat> so for example, these are three books that I like. Um, the question then is, what book should I read next? What should a platform recommend to me to read next? Um, and this has all sorts of implications for, um, especially in media consumption, as we're thinking about a society. Um, we're pushing users to uh, engage with content in different ways. Um, so we need to think critically about how we're, we're building these, these platforms so that um, uh, they, they match what we want to have happen in the world. All right. Um, so from an algorithmic side, um, this is one approach that you can take to doing uh, personalized item recommendation. It's just an example. There are lots of methods. But matrix factorization is a typical example. Um, here you take a uh, matrix of users and items, um, and you have the interactions, whether they be clicks or star ratings or purchases. Um, you have those in a matrix. And the idea is to decompose them into two, um, two uh, lower dimensional matrices that you can multiply together to approximate um, this original matrix and you can fill in the holes that are missing in the data and then that's allowing you to then make recommendations based on you know how you're filling in those holes so if you predict somebody's going to rate something very highly then that means that you're going to recommend it to them more than an item that you would rate really low all right so that's a general setup um, and you know we'll be working with matrix factorization today um, in later on in the talk um, but the question that i'm interested in or the problem that i'm interested in is this feedback loop. So we have these machine learning models um, that are, are used on platforms, platforms that, again, we interact with every single day. Um, and they provide recommendations to us as users. And we have our personal preferences that we use in combination with these recommendations to then interact with these platforms. That all is fine. Um, the challenge comes from when you take those interactions and you use those to retrain the model and then provide new recommendations to the user. So let's walk through an example. 
Say I have a preference for coral shoes and teal shoes. So coral heels, teal flats. Um, and I see a bunch of recommendations. Um, and I'm considering you know, which choice I want to make of these recommendations. Well, the closest match in this sense is a pink shoe, a pink heel. So I'm going to pick that one, even if it's not exactly what I want. It's, it's pretty close. It's not exactly what I want. Um, so that platform is going to learn from that, and it's going to recommend more pink heels to me, or it can. Right? So then the challenge here is it's made some assumptions that the interactions that I'm having with the platform are my preferences. Like it's assuming that they're one and the same. And it's not accounting for the fact that I was recommended those choices. Um, and so therefore, it's recommending me things that may not be exactly what I want. Maybe I want a more diverse um, selection of recommendations. Or maybe that's not exactly the color I want. It was just the closest I wanted to that color. In terms of product purchases, you know, the, the, you know that's one application area. But again, this can be applied in news media. And that's where it's, it gets really interesting. Um, because you can have, for example, instead of you know, pink shoes, you're talking about left-leaning news articles or right-leaning news articles. Um, there can be implications then for what individuals and society as a whole are interacting with and what we're learning about preferences and then providing as recommendations to um, the platform users. Great. Um, any questions so far? We good? All right. Feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. So why do we need to understand algorithmic confounding? There's the technical perspective. Um, you know, using confounded data can lead to bad training and evaluation protocols. So that's, <coughs> again, not great if you're developing systems. Um, essentially, the problem here is that um, the true data generating process does not match your model assumptions. Right? And that means that you can say that a model is doing well when it's not actually doing well. Then there's the consumer perspective, right? We're all consumers as well. I'm not getting what I really want. I keep seeing the same type of stuff. <coughs> I'm stuck in a filter bubble. And this system sucks. And then I leave. I don't want to interact with it anymore. From a company perspective, um, uh, companies are usually segmenting the users. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold here, so my voice is struggling a little. Um, right, so company perspective, they're segmenting the users, and that, and if we're using algorithmic confounded data, that can lead to bad segmentation strategies and bad analysis of the user behavior. <clears throat> so, how can this feedback loop impact users? That's the question. Right, we have this feedback loop. Intuitively, it makes sense to have, you know, some something's happening here, but you know, what are the impacts it can have? Um, I think that one of the impacts um, can uh, be homogenization, or that users uh, can be pushed to behave like other users. Um, and I think that another thing is that users can experience a change in utility, right? They can enjoy or <coughs> benefit from a system more or less. Um, and then users trust in the platform. Yes, absolutely. So you talk about the feedback loop. <coughs> to what extent can the users filter through some of the recommendations and, and return to their original set of preferences. I mean, you're sort of suggesting that their preferences are impacted by um, the platform. I'm suggesting that their choices are impacted, not the, the preferences themselves. But I'm kind of assuming that users have their preferences um, and that the way they're manifesting their preferences changes. Um, so uh, some systems are now giving you more control over what you can see. Um, where you can say, no, don't show me things like that. <coughs> so I think they can to some extent. I think it's a, it's a separate question whether or not users' um, preferences themselves are actually changing. Um, so I, that's like one part of your question. And the other part is, you know, can they get back to what they would want, sort of absent this? Um, and I think uh, optimistically, yes, but I can't say for certain. A great question. All right, um, so I want to talk a little bit more about homogenization. And there are two kinds of homog homogenization in my mind. There's a global homogenization, so everybody in this room is becoming more like each other, right? That's sort of global 
homogenization. We're all behaving more similarly. We're all clicking on the same news articles. And then there's, sorry, and then there's local homogenization where, um, so, you know, everybody that's interested in sports are all clicking on kind of similar sports articles. And everyone interested in tech are all sort of looking at similar tech articles. Um, so within groups, people are becoming more and more like each other. And that's what I'm calling local homogenization. All right. Um, and so this is all related to the notion of filter bubbles. Um, and we talk a lot about you know, whether or not people are getting in filter bubbles. Um, and one thing I want to talk about is what's happening within the filter bubble. So assuming that you have you know, a group of users that you're similar with, um, you know, are you becoming more and more similar to those users? Are, is your behavior looking like those users as opposed to are you, you know, is that bubble getting further apart from other bubbles? Right? That's kind of the, the intuition there. All right. Um, so a little bit more on homogenization. I think it, it can explain changes in utility, and I think it can explain or contribute to the user's trust of a platform. Right? If you're um, if you're seeing the same things over and over again, or if you're you know seeing the same things as your friends, um, that can change your experience, um, both in terms of utility and trust. Um, it can also lead us to be overconfident in the segmentation of users. So from a company's perspective, um, you can think that w we can think that we're doing better than we actually are. All right, so I'm going to talk about these two, uh, about this in two parts. Um, first is um, simulations, um, and then and we're going to go on to a, a, a user study in a little bit. So the reason we started with simulations is that there are a lot of um, things to control for if you're going to study this, uh, and so it was just very natural to um, to start in the simulation space. <coughs> So here, um, we basically simulated a table of utility. So here we have users and items, and um, the more green it is or the darker it is, um, that's you know, more utility for that user item pair. Okay, so then we have this sort of matrix factorization assumed structure of utility. Uh, and we take you know, that world and we expose it to different alternative realities. Um, where we have different recommendation systems in place, like content filtering, social filtering, matrix factorization, which we talked about, um, and then simple ones like popularity, random recommendations, and then we also have an ideal recommendation system. And that is, we take, um, for any given user, we know the utility for all the different items that they have, let's just recommend the top utility items first, right, and that's the ideal recommendation system, that's what we, we would want in an ideal world. Okay, um, so, in terms of evaluating homogeneity, I looked at Jacquard index, or we looked at Jacquard index. Um, here, for every user, we pair um, them with their most similar user in, in terms of the recommendation system space. Um, and so here, you know, they have some items in common, but not all of them. Um, and the Jacquard index is just the intersection of their items over the overlap. Right, so then for every user, they have their partner user that they're, they're paired with, and um, we're computing the similarity between the expressed preferences, the items they've clicked on. Uh, all right, and then we have two training cases, or two cases. The first um, is we have a single training instance where we have sort of this burn-in period where we have everyone exposed to random recommendations um, for 50 iterations. And then at iteration 50, we train all of these different systems based on all that data, um, and we just sort of see what happens. Um, and in that case, um, so here the, um, the y-axis is the change in Jacquard index, and this is relative to the ideal utility. So here um, at zero, that's you know it's the same homogenization that exists for um, for the ideal uh, case. And and the reason we did this is because there is sort of an ideal amount of utility, or sorry, an ideal amount of homogenization. Right? You want to be just close enough to your friend, like there's some power in that. But you don't want to be exactly the same as your friend, nor do you want to be completely separate from your friend. So that you can kind of think that there's an ideal amount of homogenization. Um, and so, uh, and then the higher you get is sort of the, how, how far away you're getting from that ideal. And so if you're going higher, then you're more homogenized, you're, you're, you're too similar to your friend um, without, you know, benefits and utility. Yeah? Is the ideal amount of homogenization, is that predetermined or is that a function of the preference matrix that you showed before? Right, it's, it is, computed using the ideal recommendation okay. system, yeah. So it's computed the same way we would do, say, random, but instead it's ideal. Yeah. 
All right, so then we're just comparing to that ideal recommendation system. All right, so then at iteration 50, we see some changes, right? The, the systems change, but they all stay pretty close to around the ideal amount of homogenization. You know, a little bit above, a little bit below. All right, the second training case is where it gets interesting. Um, so here we have, again, a burn-in period. We're training, or we're getting, we're just collecting initial training data. Um, and then what we do is we, we train all of the systems, and then, you know, we collect one iteration worth of data, and then we retrain all the systems, and then we collect another iteration of data, and on and on and on. So every single iteration, we're retraining the models. And here what we're seeing is uh, homogenization skyrockets. Right, we, um, we see the, the personalized systems, the content, um, matrix factorization and social filtering um, are all doing a lot of homogenization or uh, uh, resulting in a lot of homogenization. Um, popularity less so, but this is because of the way I'm computing homogenization being one user paired with their most similar user. If we take the user and pair it with a random user, then we'll see popularity have more homogenization. Right, so again, this is the distinction between global homogenization versus local homogenization. So um, content filtering, matrix factorization, and social filtering all have this local um, homogenization effect, whereas popularity has a global homogenization effect. And they're not completely distinct from each other, but they are slightly different. All right, so we're seeing homogenization. It's like, well, great, homogenization isn't bad in and of itself. Let's see how it relates to utility. Um, so we'll do that next. But the claim I want to make here is that the recommendation system feedback loop causes homogenization of user behavior, right? So then we establish that with simulations. All right, so then how does it relate to utility? Um, well, here again, we have this change in Jacquard index, and then we have our utility relative to ideal again. Um, so on the far right, we have perfect utility, ideal utility, and on the left, we have less than ideal utility. All right, so then what we're seeing here is that in general, and each dot is a point, um, is, is one user in the simulation. Um, uh, and we did this for lots of different random seeds as well. Um, but what we're seeing is a general downward trend, um, which means that um, the users that have more homogenization are generally less satisfied or have lower utility than the ones who um, are less homogenized and um, you know, have higher utility. And there's, you know, people on both sides of the spectrum, but in general, that's the trend. Which leads us to our second claim that users experience losses in utility due to homogenization effects, and these losses are not distributed equally among all users. All right, and we're gonna get back to that in a little bit. Can I um, ask you, I probably missed this. Um, yeah. How do you define utility? We fix that, that is part of the simulation framework. So we, we start off with this matrix of users and items, and we, we generate uh, we generate the utility, and then we're trying to recover that. Um, so the, the recommendation systems are trying to learn utility, but we fix the, like, that is known in our simulation. Yeah, I mean, it's not known in the real world, but. Yeah. I think, just sorry to follow, I think like relative to your question earlier too, it's, it's, it's like we're sort of assuming that people are, um, people's preferences don't like evolve. So it's not like wine where like maybe by taking more of a certain type of wine, you like come to appreciate it more. And so um, to, to sort of get traction originally, we're just going to sort of assume that every item <laughs> gives a, a different utility to every user. So it's, it, it's in that sense, it's user specific, but it's fixed over the iterations for that user. Anytime they take that item, they get the same payoff. Which is unrealistic, but yeah. we have to make Yes. Um, how do you hide the ideal utility matrix from from like the, the system or the observer? Right. So um, you I mean you don't get to observe it. Uh, it you just get to observe the interactions. Um, and so the way we do it is we have um, we kind of break out what users see based on um, it's basically like an, a noisy like a like an error term over their true utility. Right. So they're based they're making decisions based on a noisy estimate of true utility. <coughs> Otherwise, they'd always do the optimal thing. Right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So I want to move on and say one more thing before I move on to the next um, <coughs> segment. Um, so um, we wanted to look at the diversity of item consumption as well. So not just user effects, but you know the 
the content that's being consumed. Um, and here we looked at the Gini coefficient, which is um, just um, you know this portion. So we, if we order items by by popularity, it's um, sort of the the line of equality minus the the true distribution over you know that whole triangle. That's the intuition. But really, what you need to know is that zero is maximal um, equality and one is maximal inequality. Um, and so we can look at the, the distribution of, of items consumed in this context. Um, you probably are all familiar with that. Um, okay, so we can look at the relationship between the change in Jacquard index and the Gini coefficient of, of item consumption. And we can see that each of these different systems with their different random seeds um, kind of takes up a different space um, or a different location in this space. And what we're seeing is that, you know, for um, the ideal and the random recommendations, um, they're not changing too much in terms of the homogenization, um, uh, and they have a similar space in terms of um, the diversity of items consumed. Um, whereas the the um, the very personalized systems, so content filtering, social filtering, and matrix factorization, um, you know, very much get more homogenization, but they vary in terms of the distribution of, of items that that result. Um, so content filtering is actually very similar to the ideal and um, the random recommendation system in terms of um, the distributions of, of items consumed, whereas social filtering and matrix factorization push a little bit more towards popularity in terms of the distribution of items consumed. So it just has different impacts on the overall system. Yeah? So, um, uh, uh, how do you ensure that what you're picking up here is sort of fundamental differences are, are you sort of like doing research and doing the dots as representative parameters? Like, how are you looking at them? Right, right. Um, so each of the dots is a different random seed. Um, so it's not hyperparameters. Um, I think that you're right that um, different hyperparameters can make a difference. Um, so we did not do a grid search again. Um, and that can, that would you know, impact matrix factorization more than the others. Um, I think content filtering and social filtering are a little less sensitive. To, um, to those settings um, than, say, matrix factorization. Um, but that's definitely something that um, you know, we could pursue. But um, I think that with enough data, the systems aren't as sensitive to hyperparameters. And so as long as you're running the simulations for long enough on a big enough system, which you could argue that we're not, um, but I think that as long as you're, you're you know, doing a large enough system, then the hyperparameters uh, won't matter as much. No, that, that's that's a fair point. Um, so I wouldn't call that a hyperparameter of the, of the system. I would call that um, a choice in how the system is being deployed. Because what what typically happens is that um, you know I think of hyperparameter as something that you set while training the algorithm, whereas this is something where um, uh, you have somebody say, oh, well, we need to retrain the algorithm. Let's rerun it all over again and then deploy it. Um, versus, like, oh, I need to change this setting. Um, so I think those are slightly different. Um. Like sort of a, I, I gather we have some sort of similar reactor. Like Doogie Geek, totally awesome. This was like a fundamental insight about these different right. recommendations. But it absolutely could be. But without sort of testing the sensitivity of these kinds of changes, it's hard to know that those assets. Right, right. No, I think I think that's a fair point. Um, I would say the counter to that, though, is that um, content filtering, social filtering, and matrix factorization are all very different kinds of algorithms, um, and they still are achieving the same similar result in terms of homogenization. Um, and in terms of uh, the di distribution of item consumption, um, just in terms of like simple like intuitions, this matches my intuition because um, content filtering relies more on the properties of the items, whereas matrix factorization relies more on um, just the interaction data. So I think, um, I, so I, you know, honestly, I didn't question the sensitivity to the hyperparameters because that matched my intuitions about what these systems should be doing. Um, but I think you're right that, you know, you can explore different matrix factorization techniques. Um, 
and just say like, you know, do these assumptions change things? And my gut would be that you get similar results to these, but definitely to explore. What, um, what assumptions are you making about uh, user behavior in mm -hmm. the model? Uh, rational, rational behavior, modified inability to make rational choices. What right, kind right. of assumptions are integrated into this? Um, so there are a lot of assumptions. Um, uh, we are assuming that they're fairly rational. Um, uh, or just rational, um, but I think um, the next portion of of the presentation will kind of get at um, the importance of understanding those assumptions. So maybe hold off. Yeah. Do any of these methods include like a combination where I guess it's four toy where you're showing where some of the algorithms are showing something random and then you learn and then you retrain. Right. Um, so not every time you're showing. Right. So all of these systems. Um, have, um, I'm trying to think if I did it for these simulations or just the more recent ones I'm doing. Um, so none of them are like, a, you know, a bandits kind of explore exploit type of approach. Um, here we, we do have them choosing between um, sort of like random new items and, um, and recommended items. So there is randomness in what the users are seeing regardless. Um, but it's not like officially part of the recommendation system. Yeah, it's more like a property of the simulation structure. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in our data generation process, is there a parameter that controls how heterogeneous the users are? Then we need that the users are very heterogeneous. Then when we talk to them, that will be more not Um. So yes. Um. Um. As in, like you know, one user very differs very strongly from another user. Yeah. Yeah. So these these users are very heterogeneous. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the claim I'm making here, this is the third claim, is that the feedback loop amplifies the impact of recommendation systems on the distribution of item consumption. <coughs> All right. I'm going to grab some more water when we move into the second part here. Say something about the, yeah. the, the question of the interaction model. So this is like in some sense a big part of the motivation in the, the second part is that in the original thing um, we're looking at a, a sort of like um, basically they get a noisy signal of the utility that they would get under an item and they make a decision from that. Um, and so ideally you want something where there's a more like realistic user interaction model than, than that. Um, we were using a process that existed from a previous study, but still, you know, you want to you want to get a more realistic um, user behavior, and thus we did. Yes, thank you, Brandon. No problem. Um, right. So the the whole premise here is that we want to um, remove some of the assumptions that were required to do the simulations, um, and we wanted to remove specifically the user interaction um, part in terms of what users are choosing to interact with. Um, so what we did is we designed a game um, that would allow <coughs> us to fix the utility, right, because that's related to the game scoring mechanisms, um, to, to fix the utility of users interacting with items, but then allow for the, um, the interaction mechanism itself to be left up to real people so we didn't have to model it. All right, so what we did is um, first we, I guess, I'm going to kind of walk you through the user experience with the game, and then I'm going to talk about um, you know, why, why these things are important. So first, we had the users rank a bunch of different categories of items. And the reason for this was so that we could um, kind of map those onto, um, onto preferences, as, as I'll talk about later. So the users go in, and they, they rank some, um, some item categories. Um, and then they're given some instructions about you know, they want to earn entertainment points and they have to do all these things and they can dismiss posts and earn combo points and bonus points and all these good things um, to kind of encourage them to um, click a, a diverse range of items, right? Because we want that to be um, something that we were encouraging users to do. Um, all right, so then they're faced with this game, which called, uh, which Brandon cleverly named Fritter. Um, and, um, and the users are um, instructed to um, click on 10 items or 10 posts um, to interact with um, and that gives them points or utility, right? And so as users are clicking on points uh, or on, on posts, 
they only see three emoji, um, but then five emoji are, are you know, revealed in the full post, um, and they earn points um, and combo points if they have you know, certain combinations of items. Right, so that's the interaction mechanism. At the end of the game, they kind of see what, you know, what they did, whether or not they got a new high score, um, that kind of stuff. And then they can review um, their choices and how it, how it relates um, to their score. All right, um, so then what we did is we had a bunch of um, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. Um, you know, they have their, their individual rankings. Um, and then we have these preference profiles that we generated. Um, and um, these, what we did is we generated um, sort of a, a random range of, of points for each emoji. Um, so, you know, 10 being the maximum, a zero being the minimum. Um, and so we have this, this distribution of points. Um, and then we assign the point values differently for different profiles, um, uh, but kind of grouped in, in blocks of emoji, right? So you have all the plant emoji having similar points and et cetera. Um, but, um, what we did then is when a mechanical Turk user um, takes our, our um, you know, is participating in this study, um, they are assigned one of these preference profiles, um, and then it can be assigned different preference profiles at different points, but at first they're assigned a preference profile, and then these rankings are mapped onto the preference profile, such that the things that match their own intuition are, um, are the highest point value, right? So if I really like plants, then what I'm being shown for these categories of items will be, you know, plant emojis as opposed to car emojis. Um, Brandon, do you think that does it justice, or did you want to add on there? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just, I'll just sort of say. So the idea then is, is that you have a general preference for a category. The the payoffs are correlated within that category. Right. So each of these categories is like one of these columns, and so you don't know for any given emoji how much you're going to get from that, which is sort of signals the idea that like maybe I know I like horror movies um, but I don't know this particular movie am I going to like it so much and um, by mapping it to the categories it, it sort of aligns with your own personal preferences so if I like plants more plants for me will be the top category but maybe you like sports more and so that's your top category right and so when so Brandon and I can both play the same preference profile but the items we're seeing, so the, the high point items for me will have lots of plants, and the high points items for him would be whatever his top category is. And so this is just allowing users to kind of um, play the game more easily by showing them content that matches their own um, preferences. Um, but then we're really only looking at 10 different preference profiles um, that have kind of been mapped onto. All right, does anyone have any questions about this before we move on? All right, so then once a user has a preference profile, they're assigned to a different alternative world, um, and we have different recommendation systems. Um, we have, you know, and I'll talk about the recommendation systems we use. Um, and then we have a bunch of different random seeds, random initializations um, in those systems. All right, so um, we ran the stage in five, study, in five stages. Sorry. Um, in the first stage, we just generated um, training data by showing users a bunch of um, random recommendations and seeing what items were clicked on and dismissed for each of the different preference profiles. Um, and, then, uh, and then we continue different you know, random recommendations in, in all of the stages. Um, but this initial random data is then used to train um, the, the A tracks, um, I'll call them, uh, of popularity and matrix factorization. Um, and so then in this next stage, stage one, we s users are exposed to you know, a game with random or a game with you know, a popularity recommendation system or a game with matrix factorization recommendations. So then there are, are different alternatives there. At the end of stage one, what we do is we take um, the, the data from the popularity recommendations and use it to train what I'm calling the B track um, of, of popularity, right? And then we also take the matrix factorization data collected during stage one and use that to train the B track of matrix factorization. And so here, the A track is essentially you're using the same recommendations for stages one, two, and three, and then retraining again at this for this last stage, stage four. Um, and then in the B track, you're just retraining every single iteration. So that's what we're comparing here. You know, do we want to take a long time to retrain, or do we want to retrain rapidly? All right. Um, so in terms of utility or score, because um, score is a is a, a mapping with utility. 
What we're seeing matches intuition pretty well in the sense that random is the lowest score. Um, popularity has, you know, a little bit above that. Um, the popularity B track is a little bit above that. Matrix factorization um, in the A track and then the matrix factorization in the B track wins out in terms of overall utility. Um, and if we break this down by the different preference profiles, we see slightly different things. Um, and again, these are all averaged over, um, over lots of different uh, random seats. Um, so I think of particular interest, I think, is, um, is preference profile seven, where we see um, popularity A track doing worse than random, um, and then popularity B track doing even worse than that. Um, but then you also see things like, you know, the matrix factorization B track tends to do best overall, just like in the, the aggregate plot. Um, but then sometimes it doesn't. So like in preference profile three, the B track does worse than the A track. Um, so you see different, different um, results for different preference profiles. Um, and what this means to me is that the feedback loop really amplifies the impact of the recommendation systems um, in terms of the utility experienced by the users. Generally what we're seeing is that, you know, if, um, if the A track does one thing, the B track does slightly above or slightly, you know, below in the case of doing worse than random. So I think that there's a, re a real amplification, amplification effect happening. Um, all right, and so these results in, in this second part, I, I did want to also mention that these are preliminary in the sense that we want to do more follow-up work here because I think that, um, that you know, it raises a lot of questions for me to move forward on. Um, so I'm, you know, happy to take questions or even ideas. <coughs> Can you go yeah. back to the previous slide? This one. Um, it looks like if you update with increasing frequency, for example, in that bottom uh, where, where the um, popularity is even worse. This one. Yeah. Yes. I, if you update with greater frequency, that, then the utility falls even sharp, more sharp. Yeah, and, th and that's exactly what I'm saying is that it amplifies the impact. So if the utility is falling in the A track, it's falling even faster in the B track. Yeah, or it's not happening across the board. I think well, it's not. This is this is the only case where it's really um, where it's that clean. But I think in preference profile three, for instance, you know, you're seeing a little bit of that as well, where things are pretty close to even, and then popularity. Um, so it's not happening across the board, but I think um, I think it's it's consistent enough that I'm comfortable saying that there's probably some amplification amplification effects. But again, this is preliminary and we're going to be kind of pushing on this and following up to make sure that that claim is, um, is appropriately justified. All right. All right. Um, so then I also wanted to circle back to homogenization because that was one of the things that I was really interested in going into this. Um, so, uh, and to, to remember that there's global homogenization and local homogenization. So I wanted to first look at global homogenization in these user studies, um, and again, what we're seeing here is, is um, you know, high homogenization, low homogenization, um, low utility, high utility, just like the other plot we saw, um, and we're s seeing a downward trend. But this is again global homogenization. So generally, what we're seeing is in the B track or in the frequent retraining track, we're seeing that users are. Um, they're generally um, experiencing higher utility, um, but there's still a correlation with um, lower utility um, and, um, and high homogenization. So there's still that general downward trend where the more heterogeneous you are, the higher your score. Um, but then if we look at the, um, the global um, homogen sorry, the local homogenization, we're not seeing any clear signal that, that maps to what we're seeing in the, uh, in the simulations in the sense that even here at the end, we're seeing a positive correlation between, um, between score and, and local homogenization. And th I think there are a couple of explanations for this. One is that, um, you know, when you, you know, we thought we were just changing one mechanism when we were, or we were trying to only change one mechanism in going from simulations to user study. But in order to do that, you have to change, you know, a couple of different things. And so, you know, in the simulations, we're modeling each user individually and their interactions, but here, we really had to model users in kind of groups of these preference profiles. And so we're kind of comparing individual behavior to group behavior. Um, and so there are, there's a little bit of nuance there. Um, so again, we want to, we wanna, um, you know, follow up with this and see if, um, if you know, if with further user studies we're seeing the same thing or not. <coughs> I don't know, Brandon, did you have anything to add? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's pretty. We still don't quite entirely know what the the story is here, um, mm -hmm. but that it it definitely does appear that like the overall trend of um, that you're you're seeing this like increased homogenization that is not necessarily linked to like positive utility outcomes um, is around. Um, I think the other thing I'll mention is like. Um, there's this there's this kind of interesting thing that's happening where if you have a minority preference set, right? So you have someone whose like preferences are like different from the majority of other people, they're going to take like the sort of they're gonna have the worst experience relative to like what they would have had under an ideal setting. And that's something we also want to explore more as right. well. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. All right. Um so then revisiting our claim that the recommendation system feedback loop causes homogenization of user behavior. I think that's generally true, right? We're seeing this global homogenization happening. Um, less so with the local, but definitely for the global homogenization. Um, but then revisiting our, our, our second claim that, um, that users experience as losses in um, utility due to homogenization effects. Um, in the simulated setting, um, we were comparing against ideal utility. Um, but we weren't doing that in the, in the user study um, in part because um, it's almost an unfair comparison um, to be comparing against something that you can't actually do in the real world. Um, and so it, we, we wanted to kind of um, explore, you know, you know, what choices should people be making in the real world? Like, should they be retraining frequently or not? And so we were kind of um, trying to compare those two things. And so um, in doing that, you know, we, you know, we're not seeing losses so much as you know, just changes, right? So we're seeing changes in utility, and they happen to be positive um, in generally. Um, um, so I wanted to revise this claim and to say instead of losses in utility, <coughs> to say um, changes in utility. And depending on the match between the model and, and the platform, um, those changes can be positive or they can be negative. So you can experience losses, and you can experience um, benefits. Um, but that you need to be careful to make those um, to make those uh, modeling assumptions match your world. So another thing I wanted to say about the um, the user study is that there, you know, we fit the matrix factorization with the exact number of preference profiles that we actually had. In the real world, you, like there, there's not clean preference profiles, and so I think one thing we want to explore further is what happens if you have, you know. A, you know, more users than you can have preference profile, or, you know, uh, matrix vectorization representation for. So what if, you know, your the real world K is very large, but, you know, you're only training with a, a small K in terms of number of latent factors, and how will that impact things, and, and will you actually have losses in utility due to that? Um, so, um, so again, modifying the claim, having changes in utility um, due to homogenization, and they're distributed unequally. All right, so just some things to consider. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm interested in, you know, how can we improve the recommendation systems to account for this feedback loop? Like, what can we do better? How can we improve utility um, relative to ideal, right? Because we can't actually do ideal in the, in the real world, but we can get closer to it. Um, so the simulations were really showing that, yeah, we have, we have a ways to go in terms of um, improving utility. And then, the, um, and then the user studies were saying, yeah, but we're not there. You know, we're not there yet. We, um, and we, you know, these systems, they're still kind of the best we have in some extent, but I think we can do better. Um, and then another question is when are recommendation systems good enough? Um, you know, when, you know, at what point can users really tell the difference between my ideal, you know, item to consume, my ideal shoe to purchase, my ideal article to read versus, you know, something that's good enough. It's a good enough approximation. So that's another thing I'm thinking about. Um, so I'll just leave you um, with the, the picture of the feedback loop and happy to answer questions. Yes. I'll defer if you go out and ask. No, you can go ahead. They're they're warming up. <laughs> um, can you go back to the slide where you have the different um, global uh, that one? This one? Uh, yeah. Nope. That's that. One. Uh, so um, uh, this makes me wonder, this makes me curious about whether you integrated or consulted some of the social science literature on mm -hmm. network effects, um, right. social network theory, because it makes sense to me, uh, uh, when, I'm, when I'm listening to this fantastic presentation, I'm thinking about things like 
the spread of fake news and the spread right. of like annoying, really bad stuff on the internet. Right. right? And um, this, it makes sense to me that as global global homogenization mm -hmm. increases, people mm -hmm. would be less happy because yep. um, that makes everyone feel the same and when uh, people on uh, on either polls feel that they're being treated like they're like they're in the middle, everyone hates everything, right? right. But um, local homogenization makes sense that people would feel happy because right. it triggers their kind of confirmation biases and all these other things that we know about how information spreads. We then tighten it groups right. and the strength of weak ties across those type of groups, right? right? So I'm wondering if that, so A, did that factor into your hypotheses about this? And have you looked at other studies done by some social scientists to, to, to confirm or to, to see if this intuition that you have about the effect on local globalization has been confirmed elsewhere during that other types of studies? Because this makes total sense from a social network theory Right. Uh, perspective, and yet it seems like you're fighting it. Fighting it, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, so yes and no. Like I was familiar with those general ideas, but I hadn't really dug into that literature prior to this. Um, I, w I was fighting it because um, you know our original simulations didn't show that, um, and so I wanted to kind of I want I want the simulations to align with the studies. Um, and because, you know, I want to uncover truth, right? And so, you know, so something is wrong if they're not aligned, mm -hmm. right? And so I want to understand, is it my simulations that were wrong? Or was it something unique about the, um, the study setup that led us to, um, to have these results? Um, and I don't know the answer to that yet, um, but I think digging into the, the social science literature and then, you know, refining the studies, refining the simulations, it's really kind of, it's its own feedback loop, right? In terms of like, I want to, you know, look at both, explore both, mm -hmm. to really hone in on, on what is happening, and you know, maybe this is the effect where, you know, in-group homogenization, you know, yields positive results, and global homogenization is, is negative, um, you know, or maybe there's something else. But either way, I want to kind of you know, refine things and make sure that the things are consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Happy to share some insights. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Yeah, I. I uh, I'll just throw out one other thing. I, you, you, you made it this like great, uh, like in your examples, a lot of great stuff about like the psychological effect of being recommended to. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just want to emphasize, like in this setting, we're just like they have like they have fixed scores. chaos for particular items, mm -hmm. which basically means that the kind of thing we're capturing is like um, in a popularity-based system. Maybe I really like techie policy news. But that um, you know everybody else is interested in. I don't even know because I actually like techie policy. News. So <laughs> let's say Taylor Swift. That seems popular. Um, and and so there's that 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 sort of like discrepancy where everyone's getting recommended Taylor Swift. There's a bunch of people that aren't as much into that. Um, so I think. But the component you're talking about of like how people psychologically experience these systems is also hugely important and like completely untouched. Right. Yeah. So this again like. <clears throat> the utility that they're experiencing, I mean, like, yes, you could probably ask them a follow-up survey, but in terms of, like, what we're recording here in this score, that's fixed. Yeah. But I think, I think that, that emotional side of how they feel about them is, is something hugely important. One thing I wanted to put, but then I ended up not putting on, on sort of the to-consider slide is, you know, what do users actually care about? Mm -hmm. Or do they care about homogenization? Um, do they care about local or global? You know, and and you know, what are they looking for? And utility is often represented as, you know, the sum of the individual utilities. But is there sort of like this this impact of having a, a heterogeneous experience that's valuable either in terms of just the items I'm consuming or the items my community's consuming? Or uh, experiences if um, a marginalized population is recommended things that may be either offensive or not right. part of their narrative. Right. I mean, and so all of these things are fantastic, yeah. but it's not, not included in this. But I like I want to go there. Yeah. Right. And so please do share sites. Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, have you considered sort of any way to model of platforms preferences? Um, mm. So so you can. Uh, you know, if a platform, let's say, has certain revenue preferences or its own set of interests, right? right. And then you're you're trying to see what recommendation engine would a platform 
the pig you would pork. think if it was yeah. trying to utilize a revenue maximizing versus a consumer welfare, because you're, you're sort of, in your ideal system, you're really matching up to consumer welfare. You're saying right. what recommendation system <coughs> matches consumer welfare. Right. But that's not how most recommendation systems are built right, in right. the real world. And so um, uh, how can you model <coughs> sort of different effects on uh, uh, different factors the platform right, has? Right. Um, so I'm actually at a marketing department right now. So that, okay. is, that is definitely <laughs> in my mind. Okay. Um, <coughs> but there's a quote that I really like <coughs> from some people in the marketing research, which is that um, it is the goal of marketing to align the consumer's interest and the firm's interests. Um, and <laughs> because, you know, like, but really, like, I know it's idealistic, but, you know, to some extent, what happens to Facebook when they get bad press? People leave. Like, the, their revenue drops, their stock prices drop. So, like, if you're not doing things that are in your consumer's best interest, at least to some extent, then you're going to lose up, at, you know, lose in the long term. So, I agree, though, that there are some, you know, short term things in terms of. Revenue, but so like I'm, I've been thinking about like, do we want to maximize clicks? Do we want to maximize, you know, you, you know, revenue? So that's stuff that I've been thinking about, but is not represented here. Because I mean, just to follow up just briefly on that, you know, some of the outcomes may be revenue maximizing for the company as a whole, but a worse for marginalized consumers. Right. right. So yep. So you could have a system with where right. on the marketing world you're trying to maximize consumer welfare, you're talking about maximizing it across the whole population. Right. As opposed to individual users. Right, right. Yeah, and so I've been just kind of, you know, consumer welfare in terms of the score, in terms of utility, um, and I think mapping that to what firms value, I think, is important. Yeah. Um, because right here, like, this is basically all for maximizing clicks, right, or for maximizing, you know, number of interactions, right. um, which isn't necessarily either what consumers want or you know, what firms want, because I don't know about you, but I don't want to just click on things all day. Like, I want, I'd rather read the one thing that I really love instead of 10 things that are okay. okay. So that's another factor that pl kind of plays into that is, you know, what's best for consumers in terms of what they're actually consuming, whether it's clicks or, um, but again, this is the question of like, what do users really want? Yeah, and it's hard, it's hard. They're like, it's, it's this weird mix of philosophy and, um, and social science and computer science, where we have to like, all kind of come together and figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. So uh, this recommendation system model is creating homogeneity from uh, internally generated homogeneity by, by trying to match uh, your preferences as, close, as closely as possible. Right. Whereas the network effect story is trying to match uh, uh, your your preferences uh, from an external, you want to match what everyone else is. So there's a copying going on, copying from an exter externally driven motivation in the case of network effects, and it's internally driven by this, uh, by the uh, recommendation algorithm. So um, there are two different drivers that are at work. Mm -hmm. The yes. end result being that, the, the end result is homogeneity. Right. Yeah. But from different sources, right. Right. which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. That's a paper right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's in my book. <laughs> <laughs> I love those little, like, just to yeah. sneak it in. So we have time for maybe one more question, if there are any more. I, okay. yeah. I do have, I'm curious yeah. to know um, what ideas you have for when recommendations are good enough, and along those same lines, um, I've if I'm a company, then maybe good enough to me is if I make a certain amount of dollars. So I was wondering what idea, I mean, to go really far with what good enough meant. So what does it mean for you and the projects you're thinking about? Right, so um, I'm, I think for me it means, you know, when do users notice the difference um, in terms of, you know, if I'm given um, two different books, you know, in, do I really, can I really tell the difference between the two? I mean, they are distinct, and maybe I would enjoy one book more than the other, but just the cost of figuring out which one is better is so high that I'd rather just pick one and be done. Um, and so the part of the point of recommendation systems is so that you don't have to filter through everything, so you don't dig through everything. And one interesting result in the user study is that for the feedback loop B, what I saw is that as people were going further down in the list, more and more dismisses in the game, they weren't actually getting a, um, a lot better score. 
In some of the other systems, they would. Like in the random, you know, the more dismisses they would do, the better the score. But in the in the B loop, they would, you know, dismiss, 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 and then still get a, you know, comparable score. Like the line was flat. Um, and so what that says to me is that, you know, like the things at the top and the things kind of a little bit further down are all kind of good enough in the sense that, um, you know, you're you're receiving very close to the same utility. And so defining what that utility is for consumers is a challenge. But, um, you know, when you have a marginal return from, from more time or effort invested to finding the item, that's when it's good enough. When the recommendation system does better than you could if you spent, you know, a, a substantial amount of time looking for something. Yeah. Okay, let's all give her a round of applause. Thank you. 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 Thank you.